charade. But I don't think anyone's buying it. What? Melly, the blue. I could have done better if he gave me some notice. I had no notice. How long did it take for him to call you? Who? Oh, he didn't call. The president didn't call you the minute he kicked Melly out. No. While most of us think of only physical abuse when we consider domestic violence, financial abuse happens in 98% of all cases. By bringing financial abuse out of the shadows, Allstate Foundation Purple Purse is making the invisible visible. We can all hang a Purple Purse charm to show our support for a world without domestic violence and without financial abuse. Go to purplepurse.com for more information, to make a donation, and to get a charm. great crowd. So I have known this lady since 2008 when we did the first Obama inauguration together. And even back then, you were, I mean, you were always so well-informed, so cause-driven. Why this specific issue? So I, I have been really passionate about ending violence against women for a long time. I've worked with an amazing organization called V-Day, which was founded by Eve Ensler, who wrote The Vagina Monologues. I just love having an excuse to say vagina. <laughs> um, and that work has been really rewarding and fulfilling for me. And I also really love fashion. So this was an initiative that was started by the Allstate Foundation to create a way to talk about financial abuse by designing a purple purse. It's purple because purple is the color for domestic violence awareness and a purse because a purse is a symbol for where a woman keeps all the things that matter to her, all the things of value, like your car keys or your house keys and your cell phone and your wallet. So. The purple purse was a way to begin the conversation about financial abuse. And how many of you have heard of financial abuse? I'm impressed. When the Allstate Foundation called me, I had never heard the term financial abuse before. It makes sense when you hear about it, but to have it separated out is really useful because financial abuse is the number one reason why women stay in domestic violence situations, and it's the number one reason why when a woman is able to leave, why she goes back, because she feels like she can't take care of herself financially. So financial abuse, some examples of financial abuse are like destroying a person's credit or making their job a hostile environment by showing up and being abusive there, or cutting off access to cash or credit, which we talked about, or, um, Ruining, I said ruining somebody's credit. So all of, these, all of these are ways that keep a woman trapped in an abusive relationship. It's like the silent weapon. And it's hard to talk about things like a broken wrist or a black eye, but everybody likes to talk about fashion. Um, and so this is a really good way to dissolve some of the stigma. We also use the purse to raise money, money and awareness. And it, it, it's so interesting that you say that it's no one wants to talk about a broken wrist or a black eye. I, I guess, what was people's reaction when you first started talking about this initiative? Were well, they kind of like, ugh? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, it, it kind of does exactly what the Allstate Foundation initially wanted it to do in that people do want to talk to me about fashion, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? People do want to talk about purses, like having the it bag is such a thing in our culture. And so the idea that this is a bag that's not meant to make you feel inadequate because you can't afford it mm -hmm. or make you feel like you have to have it to be in the in crowd, it's a bag that stands for empowering women. And so to have it or to buy it for somebody, you're doing something really great in the world. Um, and then the charms you guys all have, which AOL generously bought, those charms are another way that we raise money. And you can put that charm on any bag. It's how you make any bag a purple purse. <laughs> Do you feel, I mean, you're super famous. You're on a little, <laughs> little watch show that no one's heard of. Um, Do you feel an obligation to champion these types of issues? No, you know, for me, it's almost been the opposite journey. Like, I, um, I come from parents who are very involved in their community, and I, I grew up talking about social justice issues around the dining room table. We talked about stuff like a woman's right to choose or affirmative action just in my home all the time from a very young age. So for me, actually, I always have to check myself because as I started to have more and more of what we call success, 
it gets seductive to maybe not speak your voice, to not speak out because you feel like, oh, maybe people won't like me or they won't accept me. Maybe I'll lose jobs or we'll lose an audience. And I, for me, the challenge has really been how do I stay vocal, stay active despite what I do for a living? So it's not because of what I do for a living. For me, it's like I don't get to stop participating in my democracy. I don't get to stop being an American just because I'm an actress. Well, I'm glad you like that, but a lot of people don't like it. <laughs> but I do it anyway. <laughs> and I guess, why did domestic violence resonate with you so much? Yeah, I mean, I, for me, really, the idea of ending violence against women is such a big deal to me because women are our most important resource. I mean, the thing we all have in common is we came from a woman. You know, despite how complicated your relationship might be with that person, we all came from a yeah. woman. Until science changes things, that's how it is. And so I, you know, I think we have to protect women. Um, and for, I think what was so exciting for me about this was to know that financial abuse is the number one reason women stay yeah. and the number one reason they Until go I back. I talked to you last means, year, I had no idea either. Yeah, you know? and, and so it means, oh, I can really be part of a solution. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a complicated issue. Domestic violence, violence against women, it's a political issue, it's a psychological issue, it's a spiritual issue, it's a social issue, but to tackle any of that, a woman needs to be able to step away and stand on her own. And the, what the Allstate Foundation does is they support 160 organizations all over the country who are giving women these tangible tools that the Allstate Foundation helped to develop, this curriculum on how to take care mm -hmm. of yourself financially, really teaching people how to do it. So it just felt like such a tangible way to be part of the solution, to really make a difference, to not wonder if you're making a difference, but to have really quantifiable proof that you are saving people's lives and allowing women, allowing women to not only save their own lives, but to save the lives of their children, to end this cycle of violence. And let's face it, everyone likes to save puppies. This is a much more difficult and thorny issue. You yeah, know? it is. And, and, you know, my joy, my hope is that one day there'll be no need to design a purse. That, you know, we want to put ourselves out of business. You wanna, we want to live in a world where there is no domestic violence. And so you don't need to even have the conversation. I'd love to do that. What's your designing process like? I mean, I imagine in the copious amounts of free time that you have, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. Well, I, um, last year I designed the bag on my own, which was really fun um, because I had come off of the experience of designing the Scandal mm -hmm. clothing line for the Limited that Lynn Paolo and Elliot Staples and I designed together. Lynn Paolo is the costume designer for Scandal and Elliot was one of the des designers at the Limited. And so we all did this clothing line and I loved it. I had so much fun doing it. Um, and I really fell in love with design. And that was around when the Allstate Foundation called me and I said, yeah, I'd love to, to design a bag. And I did a lot of research about trends in handbags, which was really hard research to do. It involved what, like it's, going to? It involved me obsessing on the internet over accessories, which I do anyway. <laughs> so it worked out. Um, and then this year, well, when we made the bag last year, a lot of the feedback we got was that people wanted to buy the bag. And we only made a really limited number last year. We gave them to influencers, and um, we allowed all of the organizations to raffle off mm -hmm. the bag to continue to raise money. But people wanted to buy it. And they kept saying, if you made more, we would buy more, and you would raise more money. So what I decided to do was to reach out to some retail geniuses, um, one of them being Tommy Hilfiger, mm -hmm. and I said, how do we do it? Like, how do we make this bag available to the public? Because um, I, I don't know if you guys know, Tommy Hilfiger is not only a designer, but he runs, like, a ton of the design labels, you know, owns parts of lots of the companies that you would never know he has anything to do with. Um, and he introduced me to his wife, Dia Klepo, who's a brilliant handbag designer who sells at Saks. And so we got together and designed this year's bag together. And you can buy the bag this year um, at Saks.com. And also the bags she designs are soups expensive <laughs> and like really fancy. Yeah. So we worked together on how to make this bag much more affordable. Um, it's still aspirational, but it's definitely more affordable. It's 350, right? Which, yes. I mean, by my standards is like... It's aspirational, yeah. as I said. <laughs> 
you, you're not going to get it in a vending machine. But, um, but it's much more affordable than many of the other handbags that are being sold at Saks. And we wanted it to be mm -hmm. a price where it would be a great fundraising tool, but it would also be like something that you could buy and save up for and get. And, what you does know, it say? Christmas is coming, people. Just <laughs> listen. Purple just is tell, a hot color. Tell the people you love Christmas is coming, purplepurse.com. I mean, like, really, what does it say that I'm like, oh, 350? It's totally Yeah, it's totally affordable. Like, mm. do you remember the first thing, actually, on a totally, like, superfluous, like, you know, shallow. fashion note? Yeah, like, yeah. let's be shallow. What yeah. was the first thing you bought where you really were like, oh, my God, this is a huge splurge and I can do it? When I did this movie called Save the Last Dance. Oh, I love that movie! Um, <laughs> It was the first time that I had ever received per diem. And I was like, I'm sorry, you're handing me cash to live? <laughs> like, I, before this movie, like, I, I would kill somebody for this kind of cash that you're, I mean, not literally, but <laughs> I was, you know, I worked in a restaurant and taught yoga, and I was, you know, the, the cash they were handing me to live per day, I was like, this could last me three weeks. <laughs> um, and so I... Like, this is how you know I'm a girl from the Bronx. So I would portion out. So I would portion. Don't be fooled by the rocks that I've got. So I would. <laughs> I would. Oh my God. So I would portion out the amount of money that I would need to live for the week, which was not a lot of money. Um, and the rest of it, I literally put under my mattress in the hotel that I was living in, in Chicago while we were filming it. And at the end of the movie, I had saved enough money to buy my first laptop. And that's what I did. The laptop was your splurge? Yes. Girl, please. I thought you were going to be like, it I got a Chanel really clutch. It was really nice. It was really nice. Oh I my needed God, this, a laptop. Okay, this is why I love Carrie Washington. <laughs> a laptop is her splurge. It, it was very fancy. I would waste money on like Valentino <laughs> shoes. <laughs> you know? Well, now. <laughs> I'm talking about back then. Yeah. Do you ever raid Olivia's closet? Are you allowed to raid her closet? You know, I'm sort of not because we made a commitment on the show that we wanted to make sure that I always re-wear clothes mm -hmm. on the show. So in every episode, I'm wearing at least one item that I've worn before, whether it's a pair of shoes or pants or a jacket, because I didn't want the show to be just fashion for fashion's sake, like not stunt fashion. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to feel like Olivia has a closet that we live out mm -hmm. of. So I don't get to keep things. I don't take things home because I made that stupid commitment. Um, <laughs> but also because her style is much different from mine. And... Olivia's world is very complicated and very intense, and I don't really like to take her home with me, and, and clothes are one of the ways that I really distinguish between she and I. You know, I come to work in my jeans and my mm -hmm. sneakers or my sweats and my flip-flops, and, and then I transform into this Prada-carrying goddess. Okay, with all due respect, that Burberry raincoat from Ugh. yesterday's episode, I would have kept that. I mean, can I tell you, we had, because, because I, in every scene I had to throw that coat mm -hmm. over this bloody mangled body, because um, it's scandal, and so we had like four of those Burberry coats, so just in case it got bloody. It's an expensive you character You couldn't like play. sneak one out under your shirt? No, I know, I, I couldn't just, oh, where'd that fourth one go? <laughs> it's in All my right. car. I know you can't tell us anything, so I'm but I'm still going to ask, what happens? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Does she become the first lady? <laughs> so I actually, I mean, I'm only, we're on episode 506. Mm -hmm. So we're only on the sixth episode. So I'm not that far ahead of you guys. And I have no idea of broad strokes. I mean, we don't get any idea of like, oh, this is where we're going this season. I am as shocked as you guys are. Every time we do a table read, we're like, what? <laughs> Um, so I don't know that much, um, but I will tell you that the next episode, the ending of the next episode is so crazy that I was like, uh, no, <laughs> no, well, how, that's not, how could I do that? Um, so it's great. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's very exciting. And I think the thing I love about this season, I will say this, is that a lot of shows when the central love story of the show, when they come together, 
that's the ending mm -hmm. for a lot of shows. And in fact, when we read the finale last year, I was like, did we not get picked up for season five? <laughs> like, uh, what? But the show this year is more like real life in that when two people come together, in reality, that's the beginning of a whole bunch of other complicated yeah, stuff. Yeah, especially when you've got the, ex the wife who's a senator. Yeah. This might be a little, yeah. a little bit of problem. Just a little yeah, bit a of little a problem. Bit. Yeah. So it's fun. It's good. And I know you're developing a lot of projects. What, what do you get from development that you don't get from acting? Oh, um, well, some of the stuff I'm de developing is stuff for me mm -hmm. to act in, um, and some of it isn't. Some of it is just is stuff for other people to have jobs, um, which is really fun. And I think for that, it's exciting for me because up until now, I've only gotten to tell stories about people, about characters who I could play. So I've mostly played women, one trans woman, but I've played mostly women, and a trans woman is a woman. Um, and I've mostly played black people. Um, you have what? <laughs> black people in all kinds of different situations and who wear their blackness and live their blackness in all different kinds of ways. But to the idea of developing mm -hmm. material for other kinds of people in other situations is really fun. Yeah. And I, I, we talked a little bit about this backstage, but what is, I mean, when you're writing something or creating something, do you like come home from scandal and put the kid to bed and then like at one in the morning you sit down on your laptop or do you have like office hours? I mean, what is... Yeah, I sort of squeeze it in in different ways. Um, I'm, I'm, I tend to have very productive lunch hours mm -hmm. um, at work um, and my lunch hours are really scheduled. Like if, I'm, if I don't have a lot of other time with my kid, that's time mm -hmm. that I'm with her. Um, if I do have a lot of other time with her, then I will do business meetings in that time, um, or writing meetings, um, or studying lines for our three-page monologues. Um, so I, I tend to use, I mean, I just try to multitask a lot, which we all do in today's world anyway, but like mm -hmm. I memorize lines a lot while I'm exercising, or I record all my lines, um, oh, and so I listen to them like while I'm doing the dishes, mm -hmm. or while I'm walking my dog, or you know, doing that kind of stuff. Carrie Washington does the dishes, what? Not, she is from the not that often. The while I load the dishwasher? Washer, well, sure, that's more. Is maybe what I meant? And is there, before we turn this over to the very meager audience that's here, um, do you have someone, or who is the person professionally for you that's like your, that always tells you the truth? Oh, wow. Like when you have a script or, you know, if you, if you shot a scene that you can show to someone and they're like, eh, or amazing. Right. Um, hmm. Well, I have to say... One of the most amazing things about my job is that I have arguably, maybe not even arguably, definitively, the best boss on the planet. Like she is, Shonda Rhimes is, um, no offense to all you people who have employees and think you're really great, she's the best. Um, she's just so honest and so generous and so supportive but really when I come to her she she will always say to me just tell them tell me the truth like tell what's what just be honest she's mm -hmm. she really and no matter what that honesty is she can hear it and process it and metabolize it and present you with her truth in a way that's helpful um, so I really look up to her in that regard and I'm very grateful to her for being such an honest leader um, and for having a culture of supportive truth um, but I actually have a lot of people in my life who are honest with me. Um, and the truth of that is that it means that the people that I work with, and I'm thinking about like the woman who does my social media and the woman who does my hair and the mm -hmm. woman who does my makeup, like they, um, we have become, well, I was friends with the woman who does my social media actually since I was 11, but um, the other people, um, we have all become very close because we tell each other the truth and that has not always been easy. It's not always easy, um, but we do. And, and again, it's the same thing of like, pick up the phone or text me, mm -hmm. let me know what's really going on. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, when we did the inauguration, I literally would email you in the morning and you would be like, this is what I'm doing, let's meet up here. I'm like, this is like the easiest, like, 
We had so much, so much fun. fun. This was the first inauguration yeah, in not the, yeah. 09, right? It was, yeah, it was like 08. a really amazing, like... Unbelievable. Uh, yeah. It was so a moment cool. in time, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure you guys have some very thought, well thought out, smart, intelligent, wise questions. Or you can be like Donna and ask something really shallow. Yeah. <laughs> and be all shocked that you bought a laptop. Like, what? <laughs> yes. Hi. My name is Joyce, and I just wanted to find out, how did you get the role of Olivia Pope? Oh, it's a good question. Um, thank you for coming. <laughs> um, I, so I, my agents called me, it's so Hollywood. My agents called me, and they were like, we just read this script, Shonda Rhimes is doing this new TV show, and it's as if she wrote it for you. And I was like, what do you mean? And they were like, it just, it's you, it's DC, it's political. Because mm -hmm. at that point, I was already working for the current administration. I was, I'm on the President's Committee for the Arts and Humanities, so I work for the Obamas. Thank you. Um, and I've always been very political and outspoken. And they were like, you know, it's just, she's smart and she's political and, and there's a lot of intrigue, you just have to read it. And I was like, yeah, I'm not really looking to do a network show. Like, that takes up a lot of your year. And I don't know, maybe something on cable. But it was Shonda Rhimes, so you have to read it. It's like, she's yeah. a genius. Um, and I read it and literally at, at one point in the script, I remember throwing the script across the room because it was like she was in my head. It was really like... She knows me. The problem was there were like a hundred other actresses who felt the exact same way. <laughs> and everybody wanted this role. I mean, there was a lot of attention when we first aired about the idea that there hadn't been a black woman in the mm -hmm. lead on a network drama in almost 40 years, right? So imagine giving all of these black actresses in Hollywood this opportunity, this script of like, you could be the lead on a show, something that has never happened in your lifetime, go. So we were like, you know, bah, like it was like, you know, the walking dead, like we all had to have it. <laughs> and, um, and, and I met with Shonda and we really liked each other, but again, she liked other people too. And, um, and so I just auditioned. I auditioned, I think like three times um, to finally get to the point where, where they offered it to me. Yeah. Oh, well, I actually, thanks. it's funny. I remember I interviewed Gabrielle Union last year and she said she auditioned for it and she's like, we all thought it was like, just a nugget of gold and if and if it didn't go to you that was it that was like your one shot well and that's you know? what's been so exciting is that like Empire that was the feeling that it was the like, only shot it, yes. that it was the only shot for a black actress to be a lead mm -hmm. on a show and i remember i kept saying in interviews if this works it means the doors will open it means more of us will have a shot and that wasn't about me like whether i was going to do yeah. well it was about you guys you know like I didn't feel pressure to suddenly be really good. I was going to do my best mm -hmm. regardless, but the pressure was on audiences. Like, if you guys tuned in, if the numbers were right, then other networks were going to do what they called taking a risk yeah. and cast other black actresses in roles, which turns out is not such a risk. Turns out you could have an actress who wins an Emmy, Emmy Viola right? Davis. <laughs> turns out you could have the hottest juggernaut of a show on the planet, Empire. Empire. Like, Turns out it's not a risk. If you let us in the door, we can get the job done, you know? Hi, Kari. Thank you for being such a badass and representing uh, communities that are underserved. Oh. Earlier this year, you received the GLAAD Vanguard Award for the Gay Lesbian Community. I wanted to know... <laughs> Two-part question. Uh, number one, is there a I'm personal... only taking one. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. If there's a personal connection to the LGBT community, and the second question is, uh, what's words of empowerment that you would say to a young person who is contemplating suicide? As you know, 40% of young adults who identify as LGBT contemplate suicide. Thank you. Well, that's a... Thank that, you for that question. Yeah, that's, that's a light one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. I do. I mean, growing up in New York City, of course, I have a, a connection to the LGBT community. Um, and being in this business, of course, I do. And I have family members. And um, so um, it's hard for me to even imagine not, for any of us, not having a personal connection to the LGBT community. Um, but also from a very young age, um, when I was 12, I started working with this theater company here in New York. 
Um, and it was a peer education theater company. It was called Star, and now it's called Night Star, where we would go into different schools and community centers and do a show about safer sex issues. It was like in the very, it was the, I think we started, I started in maybe around 91, so it was the very beginning of the HIV epidemic, and we would go into schools and talk about safer sex issues, homosexuality, drug abuse, all the things that put teenagers at risk. It's the best acting training I've ever had in my career because after the show, the show would be these shows, these skits that we wrote as teenagers, we wrote the show ourselves, and then we would stay in character after the show and kids in the audience would process with us and talk to us and sort of help us solve our problems and therefore learn how to fix their own issues um, or uh, dis, you know, explore their own issues. That's actually amazing, that's drama therapy. It was, yeah. It, yeah, it was really, and it was powerful for me because it taught me that you better know everything about your character because mm -hmm. I had no idea what people were gonna ask me and I had to be able to a answer in character. So. Working on those issues so early in the epidemic, and we became, our company became the national model for the NIH on doing theater education in this way, it was, it was, it changed my life. You know, it made the LGBT community family for me. Um, and it taught me a lot about what acceptance looks like, particularly, you know, being from the African American community, and there can, there's really complicated issues around sexuality in the African American community, and so from the age of 12, being like, no, hate is hate, was very powerful for me. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, so that, that's to answer that question. And then, um, you know, I, I guess this, there's this, this thing has been on my mind lately because people have been asking a lot lately about like, you know, what would you say to a young person who is struggling or who, and this idea keeps coming to me, it's not like, ideally formed, but I think this, the notion that we are not enough is a lie. And I think more young people need to know that, that like when you have that thought that you're not enough, that that's based on a lie that somebody said to you or, so, or a lie that somebody did to you. Like somebody said or did something to you to make you feel like you're not enough. And that's not true that you are everything that you need to be, that you have everything that you need to have to be the person that you're meant to be and to be the best version of who you're meant to be. It may mean that you have to work really hard and it may mean that you have to ask for help, but you are perfectly blessed. You know, you are exactly who you're supposed to be to be joyful in this life. So don't be afraid to work hard and don't be afraid to ask for help so you can get there because that's your truth, you know? And I actually think, I think that is a perfect note to end on. That is, seriously, that's a beautiful quote and I'm gonna move in with you so you can tell me this every day. Um, you guys, thank you so much for coming. Thank, thank you, thank you for Carrie, coming. for your eloquence and elegance and good humor. And find a laptop with your per diem, damn it.